exciting news to report. Our event, Inspiring Prevention of Eating Disorders and Body Image Issues, is going online. This is an eating disorders training event for sufferers, mental health professionals, counsellors, nutritionists, dietitians, personal trainers, and anyone with an interest in eating disorders prevention. And it is now online, bringing people together, sharing a passion for change around these issues. It is an event to inspire, educate, and connect with like-minded others. So why do we need this event? We know that eating disorders are on the rise, and many people in our culture experience devastating distress around body image. And as a result of this, so many people are desperately struggling with their physical health, mental well-being, and self-worth. And we know that the incidence of eating disorders exploded in the pandemic, and we continue to experience the aftermath of this. And the Lancet Group recently published research in June 2023, revealing a 42% rise in eating disorders among teenage girls as a result of the lockdowns, with similar rates of self-harm in this demographic. We need change at grassroots level. We need to implement change in society, changing the narrative and helping people to find a newfound understanding around relationship with food, psychology and body image. So be part of this change. We have brought together experts in the field to inspire and educate around prevention of these issues. And it's going to be a one day event on the 30th of September 2023 online. We're going to be having lots of talks and workshops, talking about the catastrophic impact of diet culture, looking at the early years as foundation for good mental health, talking about the hidden eating disorders with 85% of people not being underweight, looking at diagnosis, early intervention and support, talking about issues with men getting eating disorders too around muscularity talking about improving body image and developing radical self-love, understanding a broader definition of health, intuitive eating principles, is sugar really the enemy, finding a healthy relationship with exercise and movement, dealing with diet culture and lots more. So if you want to up-level your knowledge, be inspired, connect with others from all over the world and be part of this transformation, click the link in the bio of the show notes to get your ticket. Saturday 30th of September, see you there. Hello and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Now today I have a guest on the show and I am speaking to Lilia Bogova. She is a somatic practitioner of MyoBeat Somatic Coaching. She's a musician and coach who developed her mind-body practices after struggling with anorexia, bulimia, addiction and depression. She is now dedicated to teaching people how emotional trauma hurts your body and explores how to heal. And she uses body-centered therapeutic practices to teach anyone struggling with emotional wounds how to deeply love your body and to make friends with your mind. In addition to her somatic coaching, Lilia is the front woman of the metal band Kakaza, also a competitive powerlifter and an animal lover. And this makes her the expert on how to pursue physical performance goals whilst loving your body and keeping a healthy mindset about the various facets of life. In the episode today, we're going to explore Lilia's story of recovery from eating disorders, addiction and depression and how she navigated this path. Lilia is absolutely passionate about somatic and artistic practices. We'll be sharing how she uses these in her own healing and now supports clients with doing the same. She also talks about the limitations of talking therapy and the value of coming back into the body. She shares her unique methods and how she supports her clients today. It's a fascinating episode, truly inspiring guest. Let's get to the conversation. Hi, Lilia. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. It is an honor to be able to be here. So, Lilia, could I firstly get you to introduce yourself to the listeners, please? All right. I am Lilia Bogueva. I call myself the inner demon slayer because I am an integrative trauma healing coach with a background in athletic training and music. And of course, a lot of my own experiences with eating disorder and addiction recovery and my own trauma healing and depression recovery and all of that. So I want to share my story with other people to help them 
be able to relate and feel like they are validated. But yeah, that is what I do. I use a body-based and creative methods to help people tap into all those underlying emotions that are driving those toxic cycles in their life. Okay, wonderful. So Lilia, could you tell us a bit as well about your journey? Because I know you have struggled with anorexia, bulimia, addiction and depression sort of from your childhood into your adult years. So can you tell us a little bit about your story? Oh, yeah, you have a lot of complexity there. So Mm -hmm. I will start with the whys of all that, because, you know, all of those things sound like they might be kind of separate, like, okay, what does anorexia have to do with substance addiction, but they are all driven by the same underlying reasons, and they can all be healed with a similar kind of process. So probably what drove them had a lot to do with the fact that I normalized isolation from a very young age, for one thing. So my parents were immigrants from Bulgaria in the early 90s. So basically, they were refugees escaping the whole transition between the Soviet Union and having that fall <laughs> and all the mm-hmm. chaos that ensued. So they were harboring a lot of stress. I personally felt very safe being kind of alone, like that girl who does things alone in her room, which is good because I got used to working on projects, practicing things like dance. I started dabbling into songwriting actually at six years old when I heard a song that I liked and I tried to write one with it. But obviously that kind of thing can be taken way too far. If someone gets so used to just being isolated and in their own head, yes, you can take that way too far to where you don't relate enough to people. So I feel like between eating disorders and addictions, I was a lot of the time indulging in that feeling of isolation from others, which I took too, too far. As I got into my late teens, early 20s, I was really trying to avoid any and all feelings of emotional vulnerability at certain points because of just the cultures I was in. So I was pursuing sports and being a performing musician and an entrepreneur. So in all those things, it's very valued to, quote, control your emotions and not show weakness. And also to perform perfectly, right? Those things, sports and music and dance, they're about you're preparing to be on stage in front of people in real time. You have to be, quote, perfect. And sometimes I just completely lose my shit if I was messing up even in a practice session or if I felt a feeling that was, quote, weak. I was like, I can't be feeling weak. I can't do this. So I would try to block that and either just crazy overworking. Like at some point in my early 20s, like going to 2021, 20, 22, I didn't have an eating disorder or substance addiction, but I had this radical over the top overtraining obsession. So I would practice my music, my dance, and my acrobatics, six, eight hours a day. And they just have to be perfect. I'm like grinding it the hell out for it to be perfect. And I get exhausted, irritable, angry, all kinds of horrible feelings. Of course, isolated, but I was like, it has to be perfect, damn it. Otherwise, I literally felt like I was dying if it wasn't perfect. I was like, I'm worthless if I can't get this perfectly. And like for me, driving that insane willpower, I just reached my total breaking point with willpower. And then it give way into being a lot more impulsive because I feel like willpower is a drainable battery. You use up all the juice in one situation, then the battery is drained, then you don't have enough of it anymore. And then you're very prone to all these impulsive, uncharacteristic behaviors. So that's what would get me back into either eating disorder or addiction. And I did get waves of major depression sometimes. I grew up actually being a frequent migraine sufferer. So those severe migraines with vomiting, mental delirium, throbbing headache pain, that is something not only does it arise from a like abnormality in your brain chemistry, like there is a brain chemical abnormality that is why you get migraines and it does make a person a lot more prone to depression and crazy mood swings like that later on in life. 
but also that got me from a young age used to needing to starve myself and vomit a lot because that's just how it is with those severe migraines. Like if I eat anything, I would automatically regurgitate it. I can't stop that. So yes, I got used to needing to starve myself for a full day or two because I had no choice. Like vomiting became very normalized. And also that does interfere with your train of thought as well. When you're having a migraine, it's like you try to say a sentence, mm-hmm. it's like dead, dead, dead. <laughs> like right before I got into my first anorexia, actually, I started dabbling into restrictive dieting at 10 years old because my best friend was very skinny, a picky eater, and she body shamed me a lot. But I wasn't very committed to dieting at that age because I was in gymnastics and I was like, hey, I need to eat a lot. So screw it with the dieting. But that age 12 going on 13 As I was going into puberty, I had a lot more migraines than usual. I'd sometimes get literally multiples per week. So I got more used to starving myself, to vomiting, more my uh, train of thought being disoriented because that's how you feel with a migraine. Your head is like way delirious. So I feel like all of that culminated into me being like, oh yeah, I can starve myself. I can do this and I can keep with it. I was really wanting a sense of self-control. So for me, anorexia meant not much about my actual body image because I didn't have much body insecurity. You know, when my friend would body shame me, I would pretty quickly be like, well, that's because she's jealous because I did make greater accomplishments than her in the sports and even in schools. Like I knew she was just jealous, but it was what I mostly craved was that self-control, like a project that I do on my own, that I fully own this thing. So that's what it meant for me. I feel like another thing that contributed to me why I specifically turned to my body as a project I wanted to use was I think it's true when they say that when kids have experienced some sort of sexual related molestation stuff, that it does make them self-conscious. Like when I was a four, five, six-year-old, my best friend was a boy. And while we played a lot and had fun, for some reason, I don't know why, he liked to do things to my body, like lay on top of me and touch and kiss and all kinds of weird stuff like that. And it did make me self-conscious of my body. It did make me feel kind of, you know, weird to be in my body. And I did have to mentally kind of leave my body, dissociate in those times. So I think that all that weirdness got very normalized in me, which is what uh, drove me to start initially. So I will ask right there if you have any other questions based on that. Mm, yeah, well, thank you for sharing so openly, Lilia. I'm just interested as well. Are you, do you have siblings or were you an only child? Yes, I do have a brother two and a half years older than me. Mm, sure. So are you able to sort of like get some connection and sort of friendship or closeness with him, you know, with all the kind of kind of isolation or not so much? Yeah, yeah, we did. We did have some closeness and some separateness. We had some closeness, but also sibling rivalry. So we had mm. both ends of that. Yeah, and no, sure. And did your parents sort of understand what was going on for you? Because it sounds like in a way they were probably dealing a lot with their own stress and adjusting and all the rest of it. So I'm just wondering, like, how tuned were they to the kind of what you were going on, what was going on for you emotionally? Yeah, it is true that they had to deal with a lot of stress between the immigration and settling to another country. So they worked slowly up the income scale. So starting out, they really started from financial rock bottom in the US. So it was pretty inspiring that they were so willing to stick with it and do what had to be done to work up the scale and gradually give us a better and better living. So that was really good. But yes, at the same time, I felt like, okay, I need to just let my parents work. I should stay out of their hair. So I was little and we lived in an apartment. I was pretty good at just finding some little doohickey to work on and doing it myself, which is good because, I mean, it is great when a person can be a self-motivated self-starter. But Mm. yeah, I can go too far. Although when we started the 
anorexia recovery journey, it was because like I had taken my project too far. I mean, I got kicked off of a gymnastics team because I didn't realize that you had to be physically healthy. If they see that you look like you are unhealthy, you're a quote liability and can't train there. And I was like, oh, damn, I didn't expect for this to happen. So I started rethinking my project. I was like, maybe I need a new project because this is not what I planned on. I didn't think that I would have to give up one of my passions. My parents did their best to get themselves educated on eating disorders, but the culture of the day, that was in the mid-2000s, there were all these articles with stupid titles like dying to be thin. Oh, those girls with anorexia, they just want to be skinny and they don't care about their health. They're just really shallow and they don't really care. They're just dying to be thin. It was like, nobody's dying to be thin. It's a lot of emotional triggers underlying that. But unfortunately, I think that the culture of the day didn't give neither parents nor the kids struggling with it much room to truly understand what was going on with that. So they did make it all about, I mean, they, as in not just my parents, but actually doctors that we tried to see made it all about just the body weight. Like, oh, just weigh X number of pounds and we don't care how you do it. They've made it a very shallow thing, which is what it wasn't. So what helped you to begin to recover? And, you know, like, was there a sort of turning point where you really decided that you had had enough? Yes, yes. Had an, the first hint was getting kicked off of the gymnastics team, right? I was like, oh, maybe this was a bad idea. So, you know, when my mom and dad said, like, you've got to start gaining weight back, on the one, the thing that went through my mind was like, shit, they're ruining my project. But at the same time, like, okay, it was kind of a stupid project. <laughs> but I was like, really, damn it, they can't take my project from me now. <laughs> <laughs> I was open to getting a new project. I just didn't know how, right? I was like, well, if this isn't my project that makes me feel self-accomplished and self-assured, then what will be? Because I just didn't know what the next step was. But I was open to therapy, open to eating more. I just didn't know how to make myself comfortable with my body changing and finding a new direction. But dang, did the therapy work that we got at that point. We got therapists who themselves, we had like one therapist who only lasted like a couple months because she left. But the next one was just like completely clueless about eating disorder. I mean, she was a nice lady. She was trying, but we filled up the time with completely irrelevant stuff like the weather and pets and hobbies, which is like, you know, it's fun to talk about, but there was absolutely no productivity going on in the actual direction of healing. We didn't even talk about my feelings. We just talked small talk because this lady didn't really know what questions to even ask me about it. And then also right out the gate, the first psychiatrist we saw just said, oh, let's prescribe a medication. So that is a pretty big part of this story because the medication he prescribed... Right out the gate, I mean, we didn't even take any time to work on body acceptance, exploring my feelings, underlying triggers, none of that stuff. It was just, okay, medication. And it happened to trigger a lot more of those migraines. So there I'd be 30 pounds underweight, vomiting my guts out, not able to eat. It was like, damn, I don't need this right now. I really felt like I was in those months, like I was literally dying. I was like, this is it. This is how I'm going to die because that's what it feels like to me. My body is just completely in a ton of pain. And then my mind is just going completely dark because it was like, Part of the recovery motivation that doctors were feeding my parents to feed to me was kind of scaring into recovery, like daily descriptions about how horrible my death will be with this thing. Like, if you continue, you're going to die and it's going to be this horrible. So I'd be, then when I get those migraines triggered by the medication that I trusted a doctor with, I was like, death. Yeah. How will that feel? it feels like I'm going there right now. I just developed this obsession with death and was like really craving it, right? Really craving to feel death itself. 
And I was like really making plans and like how to do it and all of that. But really one time when I was so sure, it was like, I am going to do it tonight. I had a very clear thought out plan. I hear voices in my head. This voice was just saying, hey, embrace the loneliness use what you have inside of you, then later you will do something that the world will value. Ah, So use what I have in myself, then I do something that the world will value. I was like, okay, where do I find a something? Hmm. (laughs) Mm. Like, what is a something? But still, that vision that I had, that voice put this feeling into my body where I went from feeling in pain and really defeated to feeling very energized and empowered. Like, that jolted my body into empowerment all of a sudden. And my mind, it just gave this flash image, like something that the world will value based on what I have in me. It's like, okay. That sounds pretty cool because I was like trying to kind of motivate myself for recovery, but I was going through my head, all these things like, oh, a career, friends, social acceptance, money. I was like, all those things just go away anyways. Like I was just searching myself for what would motivate me to live. And none of that stuff was motivating at all. I was hearing these descriptions about how horrible my death will be and how much I've messed up things in the family and all the shame and guilt and all of that. I was like, none of this is motivating me except that voice and the feeling it triggered in me and the image it put in my mind was like, yeah, now that I want to see. So that is the jolt that I needed. Mm. So where did that take you then? Because it sounds like in a way, maybe at that stage, the therapy wasn't massively helpful, but then something changed within you on that like deep, dark day, I guess, you know, and you had this sort of vision or almost like sort of jolted out of that state you were in and suddenly you felt more hopeful. But then sort of like, you know, how did you progress from that point? Were you sort of working with anyone or was it more of an internal process or both? Yeah, mostly internal, because again, a therapist I was with just liked to talk about the weather pretty much. It's something else that was really concerning about it was I went off of that initial medication because we saw that it increased the migraines so much. But then the psychiatrist recommended another one that after getting a second opinion was not approved for human consumption because it was causing breast tumors in primate studies. And I was like, is he going to give an experimental medication without saying that it was experimental? I mean, is that legal? Isn't that illegal? What kind of psychopath is this? So I was really losing my faith in leaning on other people to save me, but that was okay. Because according to this voice and the feeling and vision it gave me, it was like, It is not about other people rescuing you. It is about me using what I have in myself, having faith in both my current state and in the future. So it's like, this really is on me. I have to own my own life completely. And it really clarified what exactly I have to do. You know, I continued some arguments between me and my parents. We had some arguments about what was really the best way to do it. Like, okay, should I be in gymnastics or dance or not? Should I be eating this way or that? And we had a lot of conflicts within that, but it was very much right for me to not stop all movement. I wasn't allowed to do gymnastics full out, but I was allowed to go once or twice a week. So okay, I could go like once a week and get some movement in me because for me, it wasn't about burning calories. It was about, that was basically the root of the somatic work that I do now. It's about the fact that I'm exploring my body's movement. I'm appreciating my body for what it can do and the feeling that I get emotionally from being able to use movement to release that pent up tension because gymnastics, you tumble. So it's very hard hitting. I'm literally venting my pent up frustration on these movements in a way that other people did not understand if I put it into words. I'll say music played a role too, because I was just then starting to play piano. 
at 14 years old. And as I got better, I felt like it was very therapeutic and soothing for me. And I could express myself also listening to music and using that as something that I could relate to. Actually, uh, by 15, 16, I got more into rock and then heavy metal. And that was again, very soothing and empowering, literally to listen to heavy metal and all its screaming and riffing and all of that, because I felt a source of empathy from that. Metal is the genre where people are just so willing to express themselves completely because they don't have to make it all radio clean edits and stuff like this is how I feel full out. And I'm not talking about screamo grinder, man. I'm talking about more like If you know bands, think more like Pantera, Metallica, Death, Black Sabbath, and stuff like that, where it's not so much like blasting in your face. It is a little bit more controlled. But yeah, music played a big role in something I could empathize with, even when there weren't people around to empathize with necessarily, and movement as well to release feelings for myself. So I got really into how I can process emotions, even if people couldn't directly understand me. And honestly, I don't even know how to express my own feelings and words to other people. So what I do now with my OB demon crusher coaching is exactly that. I give people a way that even if you don't know exactly how to name your feelings and describe your thoughts, that doesn't halt your healing process. You can still keep moving forward based on your felt sense. And then those logical descriptions can come later. Are you tired of being tired and fighting with your body while the emotional eating or binges continue? You are not alone. Emotional eating is not your fault and is complex. Are you ready to gain massive insight into your emotional binge triggers and understand the roots of why you are in self-sabotage with food and your body? You will definitely want to check out emotional eating, digestive and hormone expert Amber Romaniak's The No Sugar Coating podcast with over 400 episodes diving deep into emotional eating and binge triggers, female hormone and gut imbalances, weight loss cravings and the physical, emotional and energetic connections. After overcoming her own food addiction, binge eating and emotional eating behaviours fully and now coaching over 1,600 women in the last 10 years, she provides a deep level of knowledge to help assist you forward on your journey to food and body freedom and beyond. This podcast will help you build a newfound level of awareness that you may have never had before and there's no diets, no quick fixes and no band-aid approaches here. This podcast is about building self-love, acceptance and becoming in tune with your relationship with food, thoughts, symptoms and will help you take back your power. Visit amberapproved.ca forward slash podcast. Link is in the show notes to start listening and take the next life-changing step on your journey. You're not alone. You've got this and you can break free. You can also check out a wide variety of resources, a free emotional eating quiz, one-to-one coaching support and more about body freedom at www.amberapproved.ca forward slash. Thanks for bringing us forward to the work you're doing with your clients today. Like obviously massively inspired by your own personal journey and the benefits that you've got from really getting back into the body. Could you tell us a bit about like a journey for one of your clients? So I know you've got a sort of like, I want to say like a kind of cyclical kind of process, haven't you, that you use? And could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, that actually is fairly new because I call it the Myobeat five phase inner demon crusher cycle. It is about crushing those inner demons. Inner demons are those dark thoughts and feelings, that self-defeating mentality that drives the other patterns. So it works for eating disorders, also for substance addiction, trauma healing, depression, anxiety recovery, because we're really addressing that underlying core stuff for practicing emotional regulation and healing through your passion. So it has a lot to do with movement and music. I broke it down into five phases. So at the top, we start with a general feeling of your why, where you are now and where you want to be. And it's okay if that is not totally clear. We start with an overall sense though. And if you're totally not sure where to start, 
I'll help you out. I'll give you my own story and even find a song or movie character that you relate to because sometimes just knowing where to start is really hard. So I help you out with that. Then the next phase is start building a general mind-body connection. So learning how to identify and express and regulate your emotions using your body's felt senses and gestures. This is where we do some basic mind-body awareness, like breath work and feeling how certain emotions make your body feel and how your body can be a resource to regulate those emotions. And then the next phase, number three. Lilia, can I just jump in there, actually? Could you even give us an example, actually, maybe of an emotion that a client might be experiencing and perhaps how that's kind of felt in the body and then how you might work with that? Yeah. So for example, uh, one person I'm working with is actually a male. I work with both male and female. And now he is a very much emotionally dysregulated, very prone to angry outbursts, but he doesn't know how to identify when he's first starting to become angry and frustrated. He knows he's angry when he's completely exploding. So then I work with him on being able to feel those initial physical cues when first starting to get angry and irritated. I'll even point out, okay, I see that you're building up tension in your shoulders. I can tell that your throat and voice is getting tighter. Your voice is getting a bit scratchier. Your hands are doing a lot more twitchy, jagged movements. You're pacing in this back and forth pattern. So I just point out those kinds of physical cues so that a person can become more aware of those initial signs of starting to get frustrated. And then we work on basic body-based methods for releasing that tension when it's smaller to prevent it from growing bigger. So an example would be deep belly breathing, but you know, that is really cliche. Everyone does deep belly breathing. So I take it a lot further. One exercise that I absolutely love doing is breathing in the feeling that you want and then breathing out the feeling that you don't want. So breathing in, absorbing that calmness, relaxation, centeredness. And as you breathe out, imagine your stress melting away from you. Also acting it out like Imagine that you are putting your negative feelings on a wall in front of you and like full out be like a mime, okay? Stick your negative self-defeating thoughts to a wall. All that, I'm not good enough. I'm worthless unless I'm perfect. No one wants to hear my story. I'm destined to fail. All of that negative stuff, stick it to this invisible wall in front of you and feel the tension in it and then push it away from you. You're seeing all of those negative thoughts as being outside of your body. Because I've noticed that the people I work with will tend to identify themselves. Like, I feel worthless, therefore I am worthless. I am my feelings. So I show them that you are not your feelings. Your feelings are a temporary state that can come and go. And we practice seeing that as something that doesn't have to live in you permanently. So stick them on the wall, push it away, or gather them up in this ball in your hands and throw it like a baseball pitcher. Those are really, really fun exercises and very emotionally satisfying. Great. Thank you for talking us through that. I think it's just really helpful for the listeners just to understand that a bit more. So thank you. And what's next? (laughs) Yeah, then I call it musical expression, finding your voice. So this is where we practice actually expressing yourself in words, finding your voice. Now, this goes a long way because people who struggle with addictive cycles of any kinds often have a hard time expressing themselves in words. And that's where song lyrics can be a great guide. Like one of them that I wrote goes, Weight of the earth cannot crush my worth. Now I see it all was real. So the weight of the earth is that pressure that we feel I'm worthless unless I'm perfect, but it cannot crush my worth because you have your worth. And then to 
Now I see it all was real. That's a statement against all that invalidation that we feel because society stigmatizes struggle so much. eh, You don't have the right to be depressed because people have it worse than you. And you're just making a choice to be all self-pitying and, you know, that invalidation and all that saying that your feelings are invalid and you're not real. We're like, no, it all was real. Another example that I like, another song that I wrote goes, free from all the world can fall and I will fight to save my life with what's inside my soul. That is just what I was talking about earlier, how you can tap into what's inside of you, your soul to save your life, own your shit, things like that expression, Mm. finding your voice, the confidence in expressing yourself and how we can use music as a guiding point for that. Even if you don't have experience in singing, it's about the expressive factor of it. So we find something that you can relate to. I'm just thinking perhaps for quite a lot of people actually expressing their feelings through music, through singing or through playing music. I think it's, um, you know, a great vehicle, isn't it, for many people to be able to get their emotions out that they can't through words. Yeah, and also even to understand them as well. And actually, it has a lot to do with body acceptance as well, because I was just thinking back on myself and like, at first when I was in the anorexia, I was really into the idea of my stomach being flat. But then when you practice singing, you have to do belly breathing and watch your belly in the mirror and how your belly inflates when you inhale. And that actually got me used to seeing my belly being rounder and full of something and being okay with it. So I was like, well, that is another way to actually practice mirror work. But without just focusing on staring at your body in the mirror, you're actually using that as a way to appreciate the functionality of your body as a breath in your diaphragm, giving you life and self-expression and all of that. So it serves a lot of functions. Yeah, no, I, I love all of that. I think I can just really see how that'd be so beneficial for so many people. And then what comes next in the yeah, cycle? Then I call it natural movement and body respect. So natural movement, we again use a song to help guide you along in this. As far as where to start, just put on a song. Your body will tell you how it wants to move. Something very emotionally driving, right? So we pick something that makes you emotionally want to express yourself. So then you let your body express these feelings that you have through movement. And again, you start to pay more attention to how your body moves and functions. And as you get really into this, it's crazy. It's like, I don't care how my body looks, if my stomach is too full. I mean, sometimes I myself use this, you know, because healing is an ongoing process. There's always a little bit of more progress we could make. So sometimes when I ate something heavy and I feel, oh no, I ate too much. I'm too bloated. Then I do this natural movement exercise and I'm like, well, yeah, now it doesn't matter. All that stuff. Oh, did I eat the wrong thing or whatever? I'm just so into feeling connected to my body and emotions and just okay with anything that I would feel. And that's such a big role in this being okay with feeling any emotions. Like I said before, I would use other restriction or extreme overtraining or even mind altering substances like drugs and alcohol to try to eliminate emotions I thought were wrong and try to manipulate and hyper control how I feel. So between the singing and the dancing and the self-expression it goes such a long way in making you okay with any kinds of feelings and the clients I work with would agree with that very much they also feel that Mm. yeah no thank you so what would you say for anyone who's listening who's feeling at the moment that they're using something maybe with food or body image or other things maybe drugs or alcohol or overwork And maybe they just feel so terrified of letting go of that control and that numbing and, you know, almost terrified, I guess, that they're going to be overwhelmed by their emotions that they've been like trying to suppress. What words of sort of comfort can you give to someone who's perhaps just starting to step out on that recovery road? Well, that 
all parts of your mind and body are valuable to you. So I can illustrate it with one story, like how I realized that the voice is a great mediator between the body and mind to help you understand and feel comfortable with your feelings. It's when I was in that bout of major depression that suddenly hit like a freight train. This is right when I was turning 20 years old. And in college, actually studying music, it's like somebody flicked the switch to turn everything off. I was like, all the time, extremely exhausted, delirious, flashbacks and re-experiencing is something else that I had. And the nightmares, I go to sleep early and all the dreams are about death. So at one point, I was like having that moment of re-experiencing when I was there, vomiting my guts out, feeling like I was about to die because I was already... 30 pounds, really underweight. And I was just like in the state of total agony. I just wanted to scream. So then I actually did do that. And in the moment, I let myself just freaking scream it out. And I was like, oh, wow, that would be a really good tone for a death metal song. Wow. What if I could do that on command? I could scream over death metal riffs and that would be really fun. So I'd actually like freaking go and explore the depths of my miserable feelings so that I could unearth that and put it into this controlled format where then I could scream my favorite heavy metal songs. I was like, wow, that was actually really fun and satisfying. And that made me actually have fun with traumatic flashbacks and major depression. And that is weird, but heck, it works. And that was so valuable into seeing that those dark suppressed feelings are not necessarily something to always try to run away from because sometimes there is no escape. I mean, I was like, I'll go to bed early, but all the dreams are about death. So not even in my dreams can I escape from this. It's like you don't have to escape. Sometimes it's a matter of working with it. And the way you escape misery is by getting comfortable with that darkness And then you see it as something that is not threatening, actually something that you can work with. And that went a long way into helping reignite the, I think my mind started producing those feel good brain chemicals again. And, you know, feeling completely okay with myself. So that would be it. Just find those ways to get comfortable and accept the darkness so that that way it's no longer a demon. It's actually something you could tame and make friends with. Yeah, and a great advice. And I guess it's just like, you know, we all have that shadow side, don't we? It's part of being human. (laughs) It's so much more healthy to embrace it. And I'm sure like your experience coming out the other side, like it sounds as though now you're really able to embrace all aspects of yourself fully and experience a lot more joy and fulfillment than you were back in those darker days. Yeah, of course. And in fact, the last phase of my cycle is the somatic exercises, going more full body somatic exercises and functional movement training. And that again goes a long way into helping you use your body to release pent up emotional tension and also start to build a relationship with your body and fitness. Because a lot of the time in eating disorders, we use fitness as a way to manipulate and hyper control our body image and substance addiction. Sometimes people will use fitness as a way to, okay, now I'm no longer using drugs and alcohol. Now I'm really into fitness, but then they overdo it. Because if someone has a very uh, prone to addiction mindset, their drug addiction can easily turn into a fitness obsession and an eating disorder. So we actually start to use functional movement as a way of producing feel-good brain chemicals naturally. I help you to find the right movements to reflect the mentality you want to have so that you start seeing it as actually an emotional experience and not something about manipulating your body or punishing yourself or anything like that. So actually, that is another way of digging into your negative feelings, but then turning something positive from it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lilia, for talking us through all of that. And I think 
it's a very refreshing approach actually because I think you're just bringing together so many valuable tools that are incredibly helpful for people and I think you know for many people more well, traditional talking therapy isn't the answer is it you know I think for some people it really helps but for a lot of people it's so much more about getting back into the body and just hearing about your experiences and the work you do today, I think it's just very inspiring and will just open doors for people to think about things in different ways. So incredibly helpful. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I think the talk therapy is definitely helpful, but then you also need to do things like certain actions. So my methods are very much based on activities and felt senses. And it's like a compliment. It's not necessarily the talk therapy is wrong. Some things that I don't like much at all are the traditional 12-step recovery programs. I think that they just trap a person into seeing like, oh, I am totally powerless and I need something else to make me uncrazy and bring me back to sanity. And then I think that you're ripe to become very codependent on the system and other people the idea of having a sponsor and calling them up anytime you feel bad. And I think that it traps a person in a cycle of still being afraid of themselves. They don't do anything to make someone actually comfortable with the darkest elements of their mind. It seems like it's more about you know getting too dependent on that system. I like talk therapy too, though. I think that mm. a good cognitive behavioral type therapist plus activities to let you follow your passions. I think that that combination is ideal. Hmm. Yeah, no, sure. Yeah, I mean, it just shows as well there's so much um, value from so many different things, isn't there? And I think it's what I really like as well about when you were talking about your journey is about you really kind of going inwards. And I guess, you know, I guess you were quite, particularly in the earlier days, you were quite let down by some professionals Obviously, professionals can be massively helpful and supportive, but ultimately, it is about us finding our own path, isn't it, and going within. And people can support you with that, but no one can kind of rescue you or kind of fix you. All those wisdom and resources are within us, aren't they, when we can, you know, learn to access them. And, you know, that can take a bit of time, but it's that's where the gold is, isn't it? Yes, yes. And that's actually a title of one of the songs that I was singing. The one is called Gold because it's about gold on the other side of struggle. Gold I use as a metaphor for your purpose and meaning. I think that integrating different modalities is great and everyone just needs to find what works for them. I mean, for me, a lot of the struggle came from having faith in my own thing. It's like, okay, I recover from anorexia, but then and I even recover from major depression, but then the stigma of society and the other kids around me who were quite frankly not mature enough to understand what I was talking about. We're going to, oh, but just don't let yourself be tired and sad. You just need to work harder so you don't have time to be sad. Just don't think about your trauma and it won't affect you. And I get into like, I would just feel so ashamed of myself for letting myself get depressed like I should not have let myself get depressed like that's what took me from having this great healing journey at 20 years old to eventually getting back onto extreme overwork then impulsivity then I got into bulimia and substance abuse after that all because I didn't have faith in my own process of healing that I really needed to do so yeah, that's a takeaway I want people to have is that when you find something that genuinely is valuable and healing to stick with it, there isn't a one right way to do things. And you don't have to let the weight of the world crush your worth and get into all this stigma of society. Very true. So Lilia, where can people find you if they want to find out more about the work you're doing or get in touch? I think my website is the best place to start because that's where I summarize everything. So it will be myobeatathletics.com. And actually, I have made a free demo course where when you go to the website and sign up for my emailing list, you can get that demo course. And that is just a little bit of preview of each of the phases in the cycle I was describing earlier. That way you can start to put these things into practice and get more of an idea of what I do and see if it's a good fit for you. So that's my website. Also, 
on my social medias, like YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. I'm mainly on YouTube, Facebook, and TikTok with this. Maybe it'd be good if we link them below. Site is the best place to start. So if you sign up for the emailing list, you can get that free demo course. So yeah, myobeatathletics.com. So I do a combination of one-on-one coaching, also online courses. I do have an online course platform as well if pre-recorded content is more your thing. And also speaking engagements and group workshops. Yeah, wonderful, Lilia. Well, good for you. I just think, you know, it sounds like you're doing some great work there and lots of different ways that people can access your um, really inspiring resources. Yeah, thank you. I shall make sure everything's in the show notes. And I just want to say thank you so much for being a guest today. I so enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for all your wisdom and inspiration. Yeah, thank you for having me as well. I mean, I search your content and I really love how you get at the emotional root of eating disorders because still too much of it is made about just your body itself and how to eat. And oh, you need to just eat. So I would really appreciated the way you actually talk about the psychology behind it. I think that's very important for people to understand. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation just as much as I did. And do go and check out all of Lilia's info in the show notes. If you're not following me already, do seek me out on Instagram at the eating disorder therapist underscore. And you might be interested to join my bite size eating disorder therapy. If you want more content, more podcasts and video content, you can join for five pounds a month. Try it for a week for free first. Link is in the show notes. If you enjoy this podcast, I'd be so grateful if you would follow, rate and review as it helps it reach so many more listeners. Thank you so much for listening today. And I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon. Mm-hmm.